Thank you, Arshad. I uh, appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity for me. Uh, and, and part of my background is I, I did spend uh, three years at Clark uh, getting a master's in health administration uh, back in the late 90s. And so that was really kind of my first exposure to Clark University. And, you know, it's been, it's been very uh, helpful to me, uh, certainly that training, but uh, what we've done over the last uh, couple of months here uh, regarding the dispersion uh, of aerosols and droplets and, and how we might make people safer who are taking care of patients. Uh, I really want to uh, just thank the nurses and respiratory therapists and everyone else who works in, in our intensive care unit here at Bay State. And I'll give you some of the, the data uh, on what's happened here, but uh, Certainly, uh, no one has worked harder than, than our nurses in caring for these patients, uh, along with the therapists, the patient care technicians, everyone who works in, in our ICUs has done an unbelievable job. And uh, thank God, at least now, I think we can see the, uh, the light uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, interestingly, you know, these simple measures uh, that we're going to talk about today, I think really can make a huge impact uh, on what happens to caregivers. So we can go to the next slide. And, you know, anytime you give a talk on COVID, kind of the first uh, piece in terms of reducing morbidity and mortality is to stop the spread. And, and that's the physical distancing, the face masks, the hand hygiene, everything we've been doing over the last year and now over the last uh, couple of months, uh, vaccination. I am gonna say a couple of words about vaccination because I think it's a pretty unique technology, uh, but these other things we're not gonna talk about, the things that we've been learning uh, as we take care of uh, patients uh, on the floors and in the intensive care unit uh, here at Bay State. But one of the questions that we had early and that um, the physics department at Clark helped us with was really what's the risk of the different oxygen therapies that we use uh, in terms of spreading COVID uh, within the room, uh, exposing healthcare workers and potentially other, other patients. And we're gonna show you our, our data on how we think we can, can mitigate some of that risk relate, that's specifically related to uh, common oxygen therapy that we use in the hospital. Next slide. So, you know, this is a very uh, interesting uh, slide. You know, half a million people in the US, several million worldwide uh, have died from this disease. And this all really started uh, in earnest, you know, last, last March, so in a very short period of time. Uh, COVID, depending on the uh, age category, uh, has become uh, one of the leading causes of death. And you can see it's not only is it highly correlated to uh, age, the older you are, the much more likely you are to die with this disease, but it's rivaling um, you know, much more common diseases like heart disease, cancer, and chronic lung disease, especially uh, in the older population. The other thing that's important on this slide is that, you know, although you know, young people, certainly college age, uh, feel relatively protected, uh, there definitely uh, have been deaths even, even in, in people uh, of that age. So this has really been a dramatic uh, thing for us to see working in the hospital. And clearly it's affected the lives of uh, millions uh, and millions of Americans. Next. Just wanna go over the, the time course because this is really important in terms of when the patients are most likely to be infectious uh, so there's an asymptomatic uh, phase where, where people are infected, and I think uh, infected and infectious, uh, which has really highlighted how rapidly and how widespread this disease has become because people don't know they're, they're sick. Uh, but then after about, uh, about a week of, of being infected, that's when, when some people become sick. Again, most people probably don't become sick, so somewhere between 20 and 50% of people who are infected and, then, and therefore 
uh, infectious and contagious uh, have no symptoms at all. But somewhere between 20 and 50% of people, depending on you know, what they identify as symptoms, do become symptomatic. Most of these symptoms, thankfully, are mild. Um, but it, it begins with a spectrum. And this is, it's a flu virus. It's a, it's a respiratory virus. And that's where most of the symptoms uh, come. So you feel like you've got a bad uh, flu. And for the first, uh, you know, 10 days at least, you're, you're shedding this live virus. And that live virus is infectious. For these people who then get sick enough to come to the emergency room and require hospitalization, we're taking either another week or another two weeks um, to say that they still uh, remain uh, very infectious. And importantly, these are the patients who probably have the highest viral load because the, the severity of the disease is related to how much uh, virus that the patients actually have. Many of these patients require oxygen, and that's really the group that, that we, we focused on. And, you know, thankfully, the majority of those patients go on to turn around and get better. And now we've got some therapies to actually uh, mitigate some of the effects of the disease itself, which we didn't have back in uh, last April and May. Uh, on the other hand, a small percentage will then get worse and come to the intensive care unit uh, where, where I work, and then uh, a not insignificant percentage of that, that group dies. So once you're sick enough to come to the ICU, you know, back last April, at least 50% of these patients were dying. It's, it's less than that, but it still has a significantly high mortality, somewhere probably in the neighborhood of 30 to 40%. We have the next slide. And this just shows it maybe a little bit more uh, graphically. Um, the initial phase is really related to the, to the virus and how your body responds to it. And then the second phase, and these tend to be the sicker patients, um, while the virus is kind of, uh, you know, petering out, the patient's own inflammatory response picks up. And some of this hyperinflammation actually causes there's their organ damage, uh, hypoxia because of the lung damage, and ultimately uh, their death. Uh, so there's this critical time period in, in the middle there where patients show up in the hospital, uh, and you know we don't really know which, which way they're going to go. Uh, they tend to spend a long time in the hospital, and these are the patients uh, that, that we focused on uh, who are being... You know, treated in the hospital, also being picked up, you know, at their home or wherever they are, wherever they get sick, being placed on oxygen uh, that, that we think we can make a difference with, uh, with the data that we're going to show you uh, by wearing a face mask. So it's really that intermediate time course while the patients are getting worse uh, that, that we focused on. Uh, next slide. So at, at Bay State Health, where I work, we've had 3,000 patients hospitalized since the beginning and almost 500 deaths. So that's a single hospital in the state of Massachusetts. This has had a huge impact, obviously, not only directly on these patients and their families, uh, but, but certainly on our staff. Uh, this, is, you know, this disease came out of nowhere and has really, uh, especially last spring, really overwhelmed the hospital. Next slide, please. This is a kind of the time course going back to the middle of March of 2020. These are the number of, of cases. Uh, so we had a, a steep spike uh, that peaked in the second week of April uh, last year, you know, somewhere around 180, 200 patients in the hospital, and then 40 to 50 in the intensive care unit. This, this last surge, it really started in earnest after Thanksgiving uh, went on for a much longer period of time. Uh, fortunately, not as many patients came to the ICU, so we were consistently around 20 to 24 patients, but it, it persisted much longer than it did back in the spring. So, so we were impacted actually uh, even more in this latest surge, which now finally uh, seems to be uh, subsiding greatly. Next slide, please. And this is just the United States 
daily cases, uh, you know, starting back uh, last year. And, and you can see, uh, you know, we've had, we've had a couple of uh, dips, but uh, nothing like, you know, the last couple of months where over 200,000 uh, new cases were being reported uh, daily. Uh, thankfully, we're down to a, a much lower number, but you can see, you know, if you go back to the spring, we were nowhere even near the number you know, we're double the number we had last spring. So it still had a huge impact uh, on hospitalizations and mortality in the United States. And, and until these case numbers go away, uh, we're still gonna see, see that uh, occurring in the United States and throughout the world. Next slide, please. This, this slide just again, looks at the uh, mortality. Uh, that's that's the, red, the red line and shown on the y-axis on the right-hand side. This is the seven-day death rate per 100,000. Uh, and you can see, you know, somewhere between uh, three and a half to seven per 100,000 is kind of the maximum that we hit, but we're still in that range of three to four uh, people per 100,000. Uh, and that's in the population. That's not 100,000 infected. That's 100,000 in the United States population. So a very significant impact. And then the blue is just a cumulative uh, death rate, which continues to go up and is over half a million patients just in the United States have died from this disease. Next slide, please. So this was a question that we, uh, you know, we, we started asking uh, the physics department at Clark about, you know, can you help us in determining which oxygen delivery device is safest with regard for spreading infectious aerosols and droplets, you know, in the hospital room. Um, and then we, we, as we were starting this project, we, we thought, well, gee, you know, and we, we had some pretty dramatic uh, video of spread of aerosols and droplets really uh, essentially all over the place uh, depending on what type of oxygen therapy we were using. And, and the thought came, well, you know, we're wearing all this personal protective equipment. Can we, can we make sure that the patients are doing their, their job and at least maybe put a mask on them and see if that, if that makes a difference? Um, and then there's some, some early data came from Mass General and Brigham where they implemented this universal masking of not only the healthcare workers, uh, but also the patients, just using the simple surgical face mask that everybody's wearing now. Uh, and what they showed was a steady and sustained decline in the proportion of symptomatic healthcare workers. So this is, you know, had a big impact on healthcare workers in the U.S. It's unclear how many uh, healthcare workers have died, but somewhere between uh, 1,500 and 2,500 uh, have died, and you know, a, a much greater uh, number being sick, and then. Once you get infected, you know you, you can't come to work, so it's had a huge impact on the healthcare workforce uh, as well. Uh, so anyway, it was data like this that uh, kind of uh, spurred us to think, well, you know, maybe we should be putting masks on the patients, uh, and and that might might make a big difference. Yeah, next slide, please. So we we did a you know a quick survey here just to see to kind of test this hypothesis and see because you know we knew that we, this made sense you know that's why masks work right you know if someone who has the infection wears a mask you know they, they're going to spread it less uh, but it wasn't universally being uh, applied to patients uh, who were in the hospital and not only were in the hospital we knew these patients were sick with covid uh, so we we did a, a simple survey and, and basically just walked around our hospital on the wards that had the COVID uh, population. And basically we looked in these, uh, in, the, in the patient's room and, and what we found is really in the last box here, uh, a single spot check for compliance of face mask use amongst hospitalized patients at Bay State, you know, 750 bed teaching hospital in the state of Massachusetts showed the rate of compliance to be less than 3%. So most patients who had COVID and were in the hospital were not wearing masks. So we felt pretty well protected because we were 
you know, wearing our PPE, you know, and, and when we saw these patients, you know, we had more than a simple face mask on. Uh, but, you know, the other, the other side of the equation is the patient with the disease. And so, you know, what we're trying to do with our study, and we'll show you that, is, is to limit the uh, infectivity of the exhalations of the patients. And uh, uh, we're pretty confident that this will make a big difference. Next slide. So this is this. Uh, then we um, we looked at at Bay State. So here's the, here's the data uh, from Bay State. You know, most patients in the orange and then circled in red there um, were not wearing face masks. And these are patients who we knew had COVID. And then if you look in the green box there, the mode of oxygen delivery, uh, you can see in the second box nas nasal cannula or simple face mask somewhere around 50% of the patients who were in the hospital with COVID uh, had the two devices that we studied and we're gonna show you uh, with our data today. But this is a single day at Bay State. Next slide, please. So then what we did was we, uh, we did a national survey. You know, basically we asked our, our friends and fellow trainees around the country, um, you know, can you, can you go in in the rooms where the COVID patients are and just tell us who's wearing wearing a mask. So we got you know roughly 120 responses, um, and most of the of the people that responded. So these are basically doctors working throughout the United States. Uh, completed the uh, survey correctly, and you know, it was a wide geographic area. You know, a good representation of what was going on across the the country. And my fellow, Dr. Uh, Asad Khan, was really spearheaded this effort. Next slide, please. So uh, the next three slides show you the questions that we asked and, and, and uh, the answers that we obtained. So this was the question, you know, per your observation, what percentage of non-intubated, non-intubated, so these are patients who are not on mechanical ventilation, COVID positive patients are currently wearing a mask in the ICU. So the majority of patients who are in the ICU with this disease are actually intubated and hooked up to a ventilator, but that's not everybody. Um, and what we found here is in the, is in the bottom uh, here, bolded, uh, only 15% uh, of ICUs were 100% of non-intubated patients observed to be wearing surgical face masks. So it was certainly uh, the minority of patients in ICUs who were not intubated uh, who had COVID. So again, this is a very select group. Uh, only the, the, the minority were wearing um, a face mask and, and certainly most were not. Can we have the next slide, please. So this is this, the next question we ask, uh, what percentage of COVID-19 patients have you observed currently wearing a mask in the hospital? So these are all the patients in the hospital now uh, outside of the intensive care unit so it's that 50% that are wearing the nasal cannula and the face mask, which our data uh, speaks to. And then the other 40% who are not yet sick enough uh, to, to require supplemental oxygen. Uh, and, and in only, and it's, this is the last piece that's bolded here, in only a third of the non-ICU patient settings uh, were over three quarters of patients observed to be wearing uh, face masks. So that's, so looking at that the other way, in two thirds uh, of the non-ICU patient settings, so these are the wards, uh, the overwhelming majority of patients uh, who have COVID were not wearing a face mask. So again, we thought this was a huge opportunity to uh, practice better infection control and certainly protect the healthcare workers. We have the next slide. And then this slide really uh, looks specifically uh, at what we studied. Uh, so these are the patients, uh, COVID positive patients who are wearing a face mask over an oxygen therapy device. And again, this is what we studied. So these are the patients who have either wearing a nasal cannula or the simple face mask. And we also uh, included high flow and BiPAP but again, this is the, the majority of the patients that we studied. Uh, and, and what we found was if you were receiving oxygen, you were much less likely to be wearing uh, a face mask over, over that oxygen therapy device. 
So the last you know, thing in bold here, only 1% of inpatient settings were 100% of non-intubated patients observed to be wearing a face mask over an oxygen delivery device. So the, the overwhelming majority, essentially everybody who was receiving supplemental oxygen was not wearing a face mask. And that's the group that we selected to study. And one of the reasons we selected to study this population is because these are the sicker patients uh, and the thought is that they have more uh, infectivity because the degree of uh, illness is related to the uh, density or dose uh, of the virus that they carry. So that, that this really focuses on, on what we looked at. Uh, and so these are our conclusions. Uh, compliance with universal masking uh, was poor, you might say uh, extremely poor or, or non-existent. Um, if you were receiving oxygen, you know, it was essentially non-existent. Uh, we thought the patient should be encouraged to put on a mask. Uh, and, and that's the data we're going uh, to show uh, this afternoon. And we really think that this has a great opportunity to reduce the rate of transmission to healthcare workers uh, and that the patients should be doing, you know, at least uh, something that they can do to protect us that uh, as we're doing as much as we can to uh, try, try to make them better. And, and one other comment I wanna make here is, you know, in the United States, at least now, at least the healthcare workers feel like we have enough uh, PPE. Uh, but if you, you know, go on an ambulance or go out with the paddy wagon or certainly get beyond the United States, um, you know, that's, that's just not true. So here's a simple way to limit the spread uh, of COVID by putting a, uh, a surgical mask uh, also on, on the patients. And, and that's what we're gonna really talk about in our, in our data. Next. I just wanted to say something about the, uh, the vaccine. And again, I think that, you know, this is still kind of unique to the U.S. and maybe uh, Israel is going to be the only other country that can, can match this. Uh, but in the U.S., as of March 8th, they've already given out 100 million doses of vaccine. You know, obviously with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, uh, required two doses, the Johnson Johnson vaccine, which was just approved last week, is only one dose. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the protection provided by a single dose of, of any of these vaccines is actually quite good. So, you know, we're, we're gonna get there and I'm optimistic about this data. Next slide. I think this is important just to kind of show how, how these vaccines work. Um, you know, if you have the one, if you look on the left there, no vaccine, you got the one infected patients, everybody else is susceptible. Uh, it's very easy to imagine how it spreads to the entire population because no one has immunity to COVID-19. Uh, if you start giving out the vaccine like we've done, uh, it's, it becomes a little bit less likely that the index person there, the, the guy in red is gonna encounter one of these people. Um, who, who has no immunity, which is still uh, primarily everybody. Uh, so, you, so you do get some mitigation of infectivity uh, just by giving out you know, any number of doses of vaccine. And then one, once you get uh, above herd protection, and we're not gonna debate what that number is, but the people that you can affect become further and further apart. So it's much harder uh, to spread the infection. And, th and that's the whole concept of using a vaccine and developing uh, herd immunity. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just want to talk about these uh, mRNA vaccines. The, the Moderna and Pfizer uh, both use this uh, technology. It's not identical, but, it, but it's similar. But basically, they put an mRNA into the patient, uh, you know, the unvaccinated individual. So that, that's what I was a couple of months ago. Uh, and then that mRNA gets into my immune system cells. So, you know, T cells and B cells, primarily B cells when you talk about uh, humoral immunity. And then it tells my uh, B cells to make the antibody to the spike protein. 
So it's, it, it's, it's never been done before. It's very uh, novel uh, approach. And, uh, you know, as we've seen, at least with preliminary results, uh, it works, it works very well. So, I, you know, I just wanted to, to put that out there. This is a great advance in science, uh, especially for vaccines, but I think it's going to have a lot of uh, other uh, applications. So, so I'm going to let uh, uh, Brian and Arshad uh, take over, but I, I love this slide, you know, which just came, you know, a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, there's a patient with COVID wearing a nasal cannula and, and no mask. So we'll show you what the effect of wearing a mask will be for, you know, this guy with the control on the back of his jacket. Uh, you know, it's going to have an impact on him. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. So um, stop sharing um, uh, so that Brian, if you would like to take over at this point um, and share your screen, I think it should be possible. And, yeah. uh, and as you're doing that, I see Helen is here as well. So hello, hello Helen. Uh, we will uh, turn to you at, after Brian. And everybody uh, watching, again, you can enter questions into the chat box and I will read them out to, uh, to us or, or to, to Bill uh, as we um, go forward. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the projects that we've um, worked on in the past couple of months in terms of assessing and mitigating infectious exhalations during oxygen therapy. Um, so these are the two devices that we really focused on. Uh, we have the nasal cannula here, which is uh, this tube with two prongs that kind of fit into your nose and uh, oxygen is delivered through those two prongs. And then we also have the simple oxygen mask uh, where it kind of fits over your nose and mouth and uh, oxygen is delivered through uh, this tube here. And it turns out that uh, when patients have uh, start to have some respiratory issues, there is sort of this pyramid that um, dictates which device that they would go on. So uh, initially patients would go on either a simple oxygen mask or nasal cannula, but as their condition worsens over time, um, they will, um, medical practitioners will start putting them on a CPAP uh, or a high flow nasal cannula. And over time, um, if the patient still gets worse, they go into intubation. Um, but as Bill mentioned earlier, about 50% of COVID patients uh, end up wearing the uh, simple oxygen mask and nasal cannula. And those are the patients that we know are infected. Uh, doesn't even consider the ones who are asymptomatic in the first place. Uh, so that's why the main focus of our study today um, that we're sharing is going to focus on these two oxygen delivery devices. Um, this is just a video of me outside in the freezing cold uh, breathing. And you can see that um, as I exhale, there is this smoke coming out, or not smoke, but it's mostly my uh, heated breath that's coming out. And, um, and you can see it in this cloud form. Uh, and so we kind of set out to try to replicate this in a more um, systematic way. So uh, there, we got this device, the lung simulator, and medical practitioners use this to train uh, new doctors or nurses on how to use these uh, oxygen delivery devices. And they use this uh, uh, lung simulator because of how uh, similar it is to human breathing. Uh, it has very realistic breathing rates and realistic breathing volumes as well. Um, and what, and we really like this device because we can also control the breathing, um, all these different breathing parameters. So what happens is uh, uh, we have this lung simulator that's connected to a ventilator. And this ventilator is what kind of controls or supplies uh, how much the um, lung simulator 
outputs or how much volume it outputs and how fast it outputs uh, the air. Um, and we actually are able to seed the air with this fog generator. Uh, so here and here we have some fog that's being inputted into the device. Uh, and then as you exhale, we have a mannequin head where you can see the fog that's being exhaled outwards. Um, and the, in general, the, the fog that we're using is made up of a water, water glycerol aerosol. So this is a summary of the oxidation devices that we used and the different flow rates and well, different parameters that we used. Um, so for the nasal cannula, uh, typically the range that people um, who are on the nasal cannula, the flow rates that they use are two, two to eight liters per minute. Uh, we also just tested a zero flow rate as kind of a baseline, just as a control and see uh, what kind of differences we would see. And so the tidal volume and the breathing rate of the, um, of the simulated patient or the simu uh, simulated lung is 350 milliliters at 20 breaths per minute. And we chose this because actually the, uh, a normal or relatively healthy person would have a tidal volume of 500 milliliters with a breathing rate of 12 breaths per minute but someone who has trouble breathing typically have a reduced volume of, um, or reduced tidal volume. And so in order to make up for the loss of oxygen, um, they have to pick up their breathing pace over time just so that the body can get enough oxygen. So you have uh, a sick patient would have low tidal volume or lower tidal volume and increased um, breathing rate. So th these are the parameters we use to simulate a sick patient is 350 milliliters tidal volume, 20 breaths per minute for the breathing rate. So this is a video here of our uh, mannequin who is breathing um, with a nasal cannula on the left side. And on the right side, it's wearing a face mask right over that nasal cannula. You can see immediately that as the breath exits the nose, uh, we see th these very interesting um, structures uh, of flow and us physicists call them uh, vortices. But then once you put this face mask over, those vortices disappear. Um, in reality, it actually ends up getting redirected in um, downwards. So what we're finding is that the, uh, when you're wearing this nasal cannula, the exhalation jet can actually travel up to 35 centimeters, sometimes more. Uh, and what happens is that uh, when you're wearing this nasal cannula, the jet can actually split into two jets, depending on how it's fitted in the nose. Um, and in general, the uh, angle also varies depending on how, how the nasal cannula was fitted over the nose. So these two are kind of examples though, of uh, our simulated patient breathing with the nasal cannula on uh, through the nose. And you can see that between these two, um, it doesn't really matter what angle the head is at, that the relative angle of that jet is fairly constant. Um, and this uh, far right panel is just an example of someone um, breathing through the mouth and not through the nose. So in this slide, uh, we have these, um, for example, in this first, um, this first panel, it's a snapshot of our mannequin breathing outwards with, uh, through the nasal cannula. And uh, this is backlit. So we have a light sitting behind the mannequin and um, as it breathes outwards, you can see the fog just being spewed outwards uh, in front of the person or in front of the mannequin. Um, but in this middle panel here, we have uh, a laser sheet that kind of gives us a cross-sectional view of where uh, of the fog as the mannequin is breathing. Um, and we use, 
And uh, on this far uh, right panel here, we have the uh, time average of the fog. In other words, we can also, uh, what we ended up doing is looking at how much um, material gets spewed out of the nose um, over time. And you can see that the larger density is very close to the face, but as you go out, the density starts to decrease, but we can still see that there's material escaping from the nose um, that uh, could potentially, um, potentially be breathed in by someone who's standing over the patient or nearby. Um, so to, to mitigate this, we, we just, we, we simply got a, a face mask and placed it fairly loosely over the mannequin's face. Um, and you can see that in this snapshot, some of the smoke is getting redirected over the forehead here. Um, and with the laser, uh, with the laser cross section, you can see that some of the smoke even escapes from the bottom. And, and uh, when we do the analysis of the image, we find that there's virtually no smoke that's escaping directly in front of the patient. Um, and so it, if there's a medical protect, uh, practitioner standing over the patient taking care of this person, it would severely or greatly reduce the amount of exposure to that person. Um, and this is on the very last row is just another view. Uh, if you're looking at the patient from the forehead uh, at, its, at the person's forehead, you'll see that a lot of the exhalation is actually being distributed outwards or behind the patient. So uh, in physics, we call this sort of the conservation of mass, where um, if the patient is breathing outwards uh, and we cover it, that mass has to go somewhere. Where does it go? Well, uh, when we have the mass covering the, the mouth or the, the face, then a lot of the, the smoke or aerosols ends up going backwards and gets redirected away from the patient and also away from any person who's standing near, near the patient. So this, these are um, some more quantitative results. Um, if you imagine the head here, if, and the, let's say the nose is around here, uh, we have, this is just a plot showing how much total volume or total material is getting exhaled outwards if you're not wearing a face mask versus wearing a face mask um, uh, when you're on a nasal cannula. And you can clearly see that there's, there's a huge difference between um, not wearing a mask and while wearing a mask and seeing how, in terms of how much total um, materials expelled directly in front of the patient. And if we're interested in seeing how far the, uh, the, um, the aerosols actually end up traveling, uh, we find that they, uh, if you're wearing, if you're not wearing a mask, the aerosols can travel up to 37 centimeters, even a little further than that. Um, but with a face mask, then um, all that, all that uh, air, all those aerosols get redirected backwards behind you, so nothing gets traveling, nothing travels in front of you. So the second uh, oxygen delivery device is called a simple O2 or simple oxygen mask. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see a, our uh, mannequin wearing, uh, not wearing a face mask over it. And then our, on the right side, we have the mannequin uh, wearing the face mask with the simple oxygen. So here we see that um, the oxygen is being delivered at four liters per minute. Uh, and you'll notice that all of the, uh, while wearing the simple oxygen mask, all of the aerosols are being um, redirected away and at an angle from the person. So this view is, again, um, if you are looking at the patient from uh, looking at their forehead, basically. But then when you're wearing this uh, face mask, then all of those aerosols that would get directed outwards instead gets redirected um, downwards or away from the patient. So here's the same set of images that you saw, um, except 
uh, from the nasal canula, except for the simple OT mask. Um, here's one snapshot of the um, smoke escaping from the simple oxygen mask. And um, in the middle panel, we have the laser cross-section. And you'll also note that the vortices are even more clear here um, in this snapshot. And that just kind of shows that this entire phenomenon of jets escaping from the, from the uh, mask is really uh, momentum driven. And if you have a time average uh, here, then you can see that uh, you, you can see how much of the smoke or actually escapes from the simple oxygen mask over time. And uh, from this, we can kind of calculate what is the probability of a person standing some distance away from the person, uh, from the infected patient? What is the probability of them inhaling this smoke uh, over some period of time? Uh, in this bottom or in this middle panel here or middle row, uh, we placed this face mask loosely over the simple oxygen mask and we can see that the smoke gets redirected downwards and nothing escapes, really escapes from um, the angle that you saw in panel A. Uh, same thing with the laser cross section, we virtually see nothing. Um, nothing no smoke is uh, escaping above the face mask. And then uh, in panel F is the time average. And you'll see maybe a little bit of smoke kind of building up um, at, in the bottom region here, but uh, for, the mo for the most part, it just kind of gets redirected downwards and does not, does not um, jet outwards like it does without the mass. And you'll see that from this um, side view of, of the patient, um, some of the smoke does still end up escaping from um, the nose bridge um, up along the forehead. And uh, if you look at the time average, that's very minuscule in comparison to what we have in the unmitigated case. So if we're looking at the forehead and uh, looking at the, how much material is getting expelled outwards, you'll see that uh, at angles of about uh, 70 degrees, um, in both directions, in the negative and positive um, theta directions, we'll see that there, if you're not wearing a mask, then you'll get a ton of uh, material that gets expelled outwards. So if you have a uh, medical pr practitioner that's standing um, within that angle and the patient is not uh, wearing a mask, then you're putting the uh, doctor or nurse at risk. And um, Again, if we're looking at how far that these, um, how far that the uh, material travels, then you find that the exhalations uh, without a mask, uh, without a face mask, um, travels uh, around 31 to 32 centimeters. Uh, but wearing the mask, you severely reduce the, um, the distance over which these jets can travel. And just to drive this point home, um, we, we took a look at the amount of exhalations that would um, that actually escape from the mask. So 100% is basically, if we look at the entire, uh, you can think of it as if the patient was not wearing anything or if it was like free breathing, um, you would get 100% exhalations um, that escape. Um, but if you have, uh, 80%, uh, if you're wearing a nasal cannula uh, without a mask, 80% end up going in front, directly in front of you. Uh, and while wearing a mask, you get uh, around 10, 10 to 12%. And uh, it's the same thing with the simple oxygen mask. If you're not wearing a mask over that, um, over the simple oxygen mask, you get about 70%. Um, and if you wear, um, wear a mask over it, then you get around 15%. And uh, we also find that regardless of the flow rate that, uh, in which the oxygen is being delivered, that, that percent of exhalations remain pretty constant. Um, yeah, it remains pretty constant regardless of the flow rate. So uh, in conclusion, the, uh, we've shown that the significant exhalation jets exist uh, either if you're wearing 
a nasal cannula or a simple oxygen mask, which is um, used very often for treating COVID-19 patients and patients with their respiratory diseases. And mitigation can be uh, a simple mitigation strategy with simple, is just using a surgical mask and placing it over those devices. Um, and it can redirect the exhalations and reduce the amount of um, exposure to healthcare workers. Um, and overall, the study just demonstrates the effic efficacy of placing a simple surgical mask over a supplemental oxygen delivery device um, in terms of reducing the aerosol exposure risk to healthcare workers and first responders treating COVID-19 patients. And uh, the paper that we have written is currently in preprint, uh, which you can find on MedArchive um, here. Yeah, uh, so just wanna thank you all for your time. These are some of the uh, cast of characters, if you will, who participated in the study. Uh, we have Ram Sharma, Trinjan, Jay Consalvian, and Tan Desi. Uh, Ram graduated very recently with his master's and the other three are uh, undergraduate students in the physics department. And uh, also wanna thank uh, Dr. Scheinfeld, Helen, and Chris for their help in writing the paper and, and discussing um, the science behind all of this. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Um, I know we have a, a question in the Q and A uh, line, uh, so I want to turn it back to Bill. And and I see Helen has been able to join us as well. She was a uh, um, she was a uh, uh, a little late because she was actually working in the hospital, working the units. And so we are, again, really grateful for both uh, Dr. McGee and, 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 uh, and Helen for joining us, um, taking time away for, for this hour. So we will have to wrap up very soon, but I do want to give uh, Helen uh, and, and Bill uh, sort of uh, an opportunity to say a few more words about their perspective, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Sure. Um, yeah, a, a great uh, explanation uh, of what you were able to uh, show, and I really want to give my thanks to the physics department and the, and the, specifically the, the the students and researchers that that helped us uh, complete this project. Uh, but I think importantly, it, and, and I think you know you showed it very well, Brian. Um, when, when we're working with these patients. Uh, you know, we're near their face, especially if we're working uh, with applying oxygen, changing it, changing the flow rates, making sure they're comfortable. And, and it's very clear, you know, this is a respiratory illness. That's where you have the most exposure. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's very well demonstrated by what, what you just saw, uh, that this is a way to protect uh, healthcare workers, not, it's not just doctors and therapists. There's a lot of other people going in the room. You know, the, the patient wants to talk, the, the patient care technician will go in there and talk to them. Um, it, it's, it, it really has, it will have a great impact uh, across uh, healthcare settings, not only in the hospital, but certainly beyond the hospital. And, and you know, if you're riding in an ambulance or in the fire truck, and you're going to go pick one of these patients up. You saw the the slide of the woman uh, from Brazil, you know, just, just think of the exposure that, that she's giving everyone around there uh, when all you really need to do is put a simple face mask on her. So I think, I think this has huge application uh, and certainly beyond the United States. And, and thank you for, uh, you know, helping get this message out. Great, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Helen, would you, uh, as a panelist, like to add uh, something to the, the to here? Uh, Helen, are you there, right? So, I'm sorry, we are having connectivity issues, so I just want to be sure. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll go on to the Q uh, Q and A. There are a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yes, Helen, we can hear you. Oh, good. We can't oh, see great. you, but we can hear you. Good. Yes. Sorry, ahead. I know I am. I am sitting in the back of the unit trying to uh, uh, help the staff out. But I just wanted to say thank you for uh, 
um, letting me be part of this um, research. Uh, it was very interesting uh, working with all of you. And it does identify such a simple thing can help so many um, inside the hospital and outside the hospital. I have been talking to family and friends and trying to reassure that just wearing that simple surgical mask um, can, can protect themselves, their families. Um, and I, I wish the whole world can see this, um, these videos, and it would really wake a lot of individuals up um, that don't believe that they can, uh, they shouldn't have to wear that surgical mask. Um, it makes such a difference. And like Bill said, you know, healthcare workers, we are in the patient's uh, face. And I know that wearing the proper PPE uh, with COVID patients is protecting me and, and protecting what I bring home to my family, uh, which is hopefully nothing. So I just want to thank you and Brian and everybody at the Clark University for um, having me join this research. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Our obligation, I think, to do that. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, I think we'll, uh, time is uh, running on and I know Bill and Helen, you need to go. So, but I wanna take a couple of questions uh, that we have from the panel. I'll, I'll uh, read it out uh, or you can read it as well as there in the chat and the Q and A. Um, so um, the first question is from, let's take from uh, Brent, who is a graduate student here in physics. And he says that there appears to be a difference uh, between the O2 performance, uh, the surgical mask on the O2 mask versus the surgical mask on the nasal cannula. So can you comment on that? Which one is better? Do you think that comes out of the study? Uh, so Bill, would you like to take that up before we turn to Brian or, or we can switch back and forth? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that was, uh, you know, shown uh, through the research and I think that's, uh, you know, Brett, that's a good good question. Uh, you know, the nasal cannula, the oxygen is going directly into the nose, uh, and then the patient breathes it back out with the, with the with the mask. Uh, the mask is over the face. That mask basically fills up with the oxygen, uh, and then when when it's exhaled, it comes out of, of either side because it, it there's those side ports on the jet. So it's it's a little bit more difficult to contain. I mean, I think that's the the simplest way to explain it because because it has uh, more ways to get uh, to be exhaled, it's it's more difficult to contain. On the other hand, generally that mask uh, is kind of an up a step up from the cannula in our ability to deliver oxygen. So that's why we use it. Yeah, and um, I, I would also like to add that the uh, overall protection of wearing that mask is still relatively the same. Uh, we get down to about 15% for either one. Uh, there could be slight small differences um, between the two, but I, I don't see any significant, anything that's uh, a, like a significant trend, if you will. Um, Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next question which is from uh, Dr. Petrov, who's a faculty member here at Clark. Um, and he, this question is to Bill um, about the immune response immediately after exposure. Um, uh, the question is that um, it seems surprising and counterintuitive. And so could you elaborate a little bit about that? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, and I uh, I'm not an immunologist and I don't think all of this is, is completely understood. And I think Dr. Petroff is correct that a small uh, viral load can make you sick and sick enough to die. There's no question about that. Um, but all of the, the data and the anecdotes that are out there now, um, look at this kind of dose response. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm infected and then someone comes in and talks to me face to face, but you know, we just say hello and then they walk away, they're probably not going to get sick. Uh, on the other hand, if we're in the basement of the church, all the windows are closed 
and I'm infected and then I'm singing there for two hours, um, you know, you're, you're much more likely to be uh, infected. So that's just based on a lot of anecdotal evidence that exists uh, that in those environments uh, where people are close together for a long period of time, you know, that's, that's where the greatest risk is. And I think, you know, Brian showed it very nicely in the slides. There, there's, there's a density of aerosols and droplets right in the front of the patient. And, and that's where we work. And, and that's why I think this work is so, uh, so important. But in terms of the immune response, you know, that, that's something I've learned a lot about in the, in the last nine months, but I'm, I'm still uh, not even at the novice uh, level. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, if I may ask you a question, uh, uh, and and the rest of you, we will have to wrap up soon. So if you have a question, just uh, write it right now as I'm asking him and answering him. Uh, so, Bill, uh, here we are talking about uh, these mitigation strategies uh, or or this risk related to COVID-19, and and how similar is this disease to some of the other respiratory diseases that you treat or have been treating? So is this an issue, if you like, um, for this particular pandemic, which we hope uh, uh, is, is uh, past its half point, or, or is this a continuing issue into the future? Um, so I think I asked you a couple of questions, so I, I can break it down to you if you, if you like, but how, how far does this go beyond COVID-19? Yeah, so I, I think, the, again, uh, great questions. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just an intensivist, so so we 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 try to support uh, organ failure and shock primarily. Uh, I'm not an infectious disease expert, but I I could say this, um, you know, for the the flu in general, which is a contagious respiratory infectious disease, um, there's no doubt that that this type of application of a surgical mask over a sick patient will will mitigate um, the spread. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, other diseases that we deal with uh, on a you know, not uh, infrequent basis uh, that have a contagiousness to it, you know, things like uh, tuberculosis, meningococcal meningitis, which can be also a lung disease, uh, other viral infections, um, rubella, uh, that may affect the, uh, the lungs, uh, very rarely measles we see uh, even in adults. You know, I, I think for all, for all those where the, we know that the disease is contagious and it's spread by breathing, uh, I think uh, clearly this will have uh, an application. And unfortunately, if you kind of look back historically, you know, every 10 years we get some type of pandemic. Uh, you know, nothing's been this large really for 100 years, uh, but certainly every, every decade or so, there's been something uh, that infects a lot of people because they have no immunity to it uh, specifically. And I think that's clearly what's unique about COVID. There's no immunity. So that's why it's been so explosively contagious, um, uh, but are maybe a little bit harder to spread. And, and so that's why it hasn't been as big as, as the COVID pandemic is. But I think for any disease that's spread from person to person through uh through breathing, uh, this uh, approach will have a, an impact. Thank you, Dr. McKee. So um, at that point, if there are no further questions, um, we'll close the webinar at this time. Thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you at another occasion. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Thanks everyone.